Greetings and salutations, everybody. This is Dave Duford, owner and operator of Final Expense Agent Mentor, where I help agents succeed in the final expense business. And today, we are continuing our top producers interview segment with a uh, man that many know in the final expense business. His name is Allentown. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Allentown. He is the founder of Agent Service Connection and has worked exclusively in the final expense market since 1993. And uh, to kind of give you a little sizzle to the steak, uh, I want to share some extremely impressive stats about Mr. Town. So first of all, he has recruited uh, in excess of 10,000 final expense agents. Uh, Allen and his affiliates have written in excess of a half of a billion dollars in final expense sales since he began. And that's half of a billion. That's a lot of business. Allen is the chief architect and designer of Colombian Life's successful final expense product. And with Colombian alone, uh, he has issued paid in excess of 200 million in premium. And uh, also, Alan does business and is also the largest distributor for Oxford Life and Kemper's Life final expense products and has been so uh, for the last nine years for, with Oxford and the last five years uh, with Kemper. So, without further ado, Mr. Town, welcome. Thank you so much for uh, agreeing to the interview today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. And, uh, you know, again, I've been following you online as well for, for quite some time and have been very impressed with uh, some of your training and some of the things that you've been able to do with, uh, with your distribution and really, quite frankly, for our industry uh, as it relates to uh, product training, which is, for me, uh, key uh, to the success of every final expense program. Uh, you know, your, your book of business is only is, is really as good as the people that are out there selling it. So if you write a quality book of business and every carrier does, you must have a quality trained distribution. So I, I thank you for what you're doing uh, in the market as well with, uh, with that good training. Uh, so uh, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, thank you so much for the kind words and let's jump right into these questions. So um, tell us a little bit about your humble beginnings of getting involved in the final expense market or just really insurance. How did you get into it? What were you involved in? Kind of tell us of that transition. You bet. Uh, uh, next week will mark uh, my 30th year in the business. Uh, actually, I, I got in uh, back in uh, back in 1988, uh, really by accident. I was uh, I was uh, uh, a young kid, 23, uh, kind of trying to figure out what I what I was going to do for a living, and uh, I knew it would probably be some kind of sales. I was uh, waiting tables actually at the time, and uh, had uh, moved to Florida. I grew up in Rhode Island, moved to Florida uh, out of school, um, just thought I'd go down there and mess around for a while in Clearwater and uh, Florida and uh, play on the beach, wait tables, uh, go to the gym, lift weights, and, and just uh, have a little fun for a while before I decided to get serious about life. And at that point, of course, I was going to move back to Rhode Island and, 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 and get what I figured would be a real job. Um, but I, I found the insurance business really just by accident. Um, it, uh, it was kind of a serendipity. Uh, it's, it's funny, you know, some people get lucky in life and figure out what they're good at, um, uh, at an early age. Some people never figure out really what they're, I follow John Maxwell quite a bit. John Maxwell is a wonderful leadership guru and I study a lot of his, uh, a lot of his books. He's one of the, uh, he's, a, he's a New York times bestseller, uh, many, many times over. Um, and he talks about finding your giftedness and everybody has a gift. Everybody has a, a has something that they're very, very good at. Uh, some of us get lucky and figure it out early in life. Some of us don't get lucky and don't ever figure it out. I figured it out when I was really, early, really young. And so I, I met, uh, through a friend of mine that I made in Florida, um, uh, um, uh, a gentleman that owned a company called Capital Marketing Group in Clearwater, Florida, and they were an insurance brokerage company, <clears throat> and they were working heavy in the Medicare supplements and, uh, and and really the individual major medical markets. They were a brokerage house, and um, I, I I met the owner of the company. He took a liking to me, and uh, asked me what I was doing waiting tables and you know, wasn't even to get a real job. And I said, well, uh, you know. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure things out at this point. And he said, well, heck, why don't you come on and see me on Friday? I'd like to interview you and get to know you better. And um, so I did that. I, I went in with the one suit that I owned and uh, 
and uh, my American tourister briefcase uh, with a, I think I had a banana and maybe an apple in it. I just wanted to look like I was important. Actually, looked like I could. Uh, I, I think I, I figured out early in life that it's 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 important to kind of fake it until you make it. You've got to look the part. You know, you have to act as if. Okay, right. so. Um, I acted as if, so I walked in there looking like a little businessman, or at least I thought I did. So I uh, had a great interview. Um, uh, the gentleman described uh, the, the company to me and what they were doing, what their objectives were. They're a marketing company. They're an FMO, um, hiring agents all over America. Yeah, so uh, so the gentleman told me uh, about his company and what Capital Marketing Group was all about, and they were uh, there were six uh, marketers in there at that time, and he said he... he he needed somebody else on the phones. And again, back then there was no such thing as an internet. We didn't have cell phones back then. Okay. There was no GPS. Uh, things were a little bit more difficult back in those days. So uh, he, uh, he took a liking to me. We had a great interview. He handed me his sales brochures for his primary company. He said, take this home over the weekend, come back on Monday. I'm going to give you a quiz. If you've taken the initiative to learn the products. And if I feel like you've, uh, uh, you, 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 die, you know, dove in deep enough and uh, if I feel like you uh, are going to take this seriously, that, uh, uh, that uh, one cubicle in the back there with a phone uh, and an empty chair will become yours. So um, I came back, I, went, I spent the weekend on the beach like I, I was doing back in those days uh, with the sales brochure in my hand and rates and trying to figure out what, what insurance even meant. Because I I knew nothing about the insurance industry like like all of us as we enter the business it's uh, it's a totally different language for us and uh, it's amazing what you have to learn as it relates to health conditions health issues uh, chronic conditions uh, medications uh, it's it's a it's a world that a lot of us don't really think about that we have to hone in on and become really very proficient at if we're going to become real professionals within our within our business and uh, it's pretty impressive to listen to some people talk as it relates to their knowledge for diabetes, and respiratory, and heart, and cancer, and all these various things. So um, I came back on Monday, uh, I convinced uh, this, uh, this gentleman that I had taken this seriously and I had a job. It paid me 18,000 a year salary, $350 a week, plus benefits. So uh, at that point, that was satisfactory, and I went to work. So, uh, yeah, humble beginnings for most people, um, including me. So we we went to work uh, marketing product. What they gave me was a list of agents, gave me basically kind of a canned script, uh, and of course I had to create uh, and make that script my own. Contact agents on the phone, uh, get them uh, first. Determine are you even in this particularly for the market. So uh, here's what, we, what we've got to offer. Here's why we think it would be a benefit to, to have you added to your portfolio. May I send you a packet? May I send you a sales kit? I'll follow up with you in a week and we'll review it and see if it looks like it might complement your existing portfolio. That's what I did. And uh, my task was to recruit agents and to get them into production. So uh, went along. Uh, six months later, another much larger organization, Amerilife, out of Clearwater, had, uh, had, had merged us into their company. And they had bought us out. They then at that time had 10 uh, recruiters, marketers on the phone, and were looking for uh, 15 total. So they bought our company. They, uh, they brought us in. Uh, they immediately doubled our, our, our salaries. Uh, but called it a draw against commissions. So I went from 350 a week overnight to 700 a week uh, with a $500 bonus if I was able to recruit uh, uh, 100 plus agents in a month. The requirement was that we had to hire at least 50 new agents per month in order to keep our job. Um, so we had uh, 15 uh, agents uh, recruiters marketers like myself in there just uh, dialing for dollars all day long just uh, you know uh, just get on the phone all day long and, and, and I figured out early in life I was uh, 23 at the time that I was actually pretty good on the phone 
And uh, some people hate the phone. I, for whatever reason, uh, have never had that attitude. The phone and I have always been pretty friendly. So you've got to take that attitude, obviously, or at least convince yourself that you enjoy working on a phone um, and, uh, and go to work. The thing that motivated me, and I was never motivated by money when I was young. Money was not something that was in the, in the cards for me. I was not ever supposed to become successful financially. Uh, I come from a blue-collar family, uh, upper, upper blue-collar, if you will. You know, my dad never made more than 43000 a year. Uh, my mom didn't work. Uh, uh, two other brothers in the, in the house. Uh, we, uh, we were a frugal family. Um, I, I went to college, but I quit. Uh, I was bored, had no idea what I wanted to do. Dropped out of college. So again, I wasn't supposed to become anything super successful. So I think I, my story is very similar to many. I think uh, great final expense agents right now, uh, you know, we're not Ivy Leaguers. You don't need to be an Ivy Leaguer to find great success and fulfillment in this particular space, which is why it's so special. So um, I was able to uh, become uh, the very top uh, recruiter, marketer in this organization uh, within a couple of years. What incentivized me and motivated me was money. Uh, because I discovered the what I what I learned about myself was that this was an opportunity where I was going to be able to uh, achieve some great financial success. Uh, there was one recruiter in the office, and this is back this time now, 1989, that was making twenty thousand dollars per month. Wow, a lot of money back then. There was that twenty percent <laughs> gap. Oh, it's a it's a tremendous amount of money today. Yeah. It's a tremendous amount. Of it was a tremendous amount of money back then. I mean, we're going back 29 years now. So uh, uh, this was a guy that uh, uh, grew up in Kentucky, uh, not college educated, uh, a very simple guy, hardworking guy, ethical guy, honest guy, a guy that I admired a lot, uh, probably 38 or 40 at the time. Um, 20% of the action belonged to us. That was the deal in the agency. So we brought in, he was bringing $100,000 of commission income into the agency per month. 20% of that was his, $20,000 a month. It was amazing. So I was motivated by that because I looked at this guy and I thought to myself, um, you've got nothing on me other than time. Right. Time for business. That's all you've got. I'm ethical. I'm honest. I will work as hard or harder than you, and I'm going to shadow you. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to ask you many questions. I'm going to become your best friend. So one of the things I'm going to encourage, and I always encourage good agents to do, if, you're, if you work within a, a, a successful agency, become very friendly with their top people. Find out what it is that they're doing. Try to shadow them. Ask them questions. They're, you're going to find that most of them want to help you. Most of them do want to, they don't want to be at the top all by themselves. They want, they want others, they want to raise the bar. They do want the accolades, but at the same time, they want to be pushed. And the only way to be pushed is to have some folks that are nipping at your, at your toes constantly. So um, I, I took that attitude and uh, I, I never reached the level of success that, that he did in this agency. But back in 92, I was made an offer that I couldn't refuse to go, to go join another agency in uh, Austin, Texas. So I packed my bags and, uh, and I moved to Texas. And I went to work as the national marketing director for another very large insurance brokerage firm uh, out there back in 92. Now, back in those days when we were pushing heavy, heavy, heavy was the Medicare supplement products. The Medicare supplements were hot back then. Long-term care was a fairly new product, and we were starting to pioneer uh, that particular uh, uh, product line as well within the senior market. Uh, but we had a tough go of it. Uh, underwriting was pretty tough. Uh, it would take a month or so to, to get a decision, and so that was a tough market. The Medicare supplement was an instant gratification business. Uh, it was a simple yes-no app. Uh, 
we paid first year commissions that were upward to 60, 65% with about a 10% removal. Uh, and then in 1993, the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, the NAIC, came in and they levelized commissions because agents were taking advantage of that particular space and in the very vulnerable senior citizen market that we were serving by replacing their business each year in order to get another first year commission. That is very dangerous practice. And uh, the insurance commissioners came in and said, you know what, we're gonna put our foot down and we're gonna self police this. And we're gonna levelize commissions. So now our commissions went from 60 plus percent to 18 to about 22% in that range, levelized for six years. That completely changed the landscape of the senior market. And uh, agents were no longer able to get out there unless they had a strong renewal income uh, and generate enough in first year commissions to pay for their leads and actually still put enough money in their pocket to make, uh, to make a worthwhile week. So, we got involved with a company called Accordia Senior Benefits that had a very low cost Medicare supplement, but they also had a product that they called a senior life product. And the commissions on that product were 75% with a 10% renewal, you know, through the 10th year, which is pretty darn good renewal. There wasn't a lot of first year commission in the deal. Uh, our, our take on that was, uh, 85% for the FMO. So there were two contract levels. We had a PPGA distribution back in, the, in those days. That's a personal producer uh, uh, distribution. We didn't have big agencies in the business back then. We were going after personal producers. And, and uh, the folks that we were hiring were essentially med sub agents, but they were looking for other opportunities where they could capitalize on big first year commission using a, a simplified issue product. So we, we discovered about six months into that, into that pro product line uh, and into that relationship that we were writing about 100 cases a month with that senior life product just by accident. We didn't, we didn't know anything about that particular business. And it grabbed our attention with, you know, and we got to thinking and got to talking. There was one actual, there, there was a competing FMO out of uh, Georgia uh, that I had a relationship with that was writing about 300 cases a month and um, in that particular market. So we, we had communication with him and we started to learn about this thing called final expense. Back then, a lot of us called it burial insurance, um, but it was final expense. And we decided, you know what, we're gonna, we're gonna take a look at this particular market. We're gonna go ahead and investigate. So we did some investigating, found out there was a company out there called London Insurance Group, Lincoln Heritage, that is, as far as I'm concerned, is a company that gets great, uh, uh, great accolades from me. I've got great respect for them. I've never done business with them and I never will, but I have great respect for them because they're the fathers of final expense. Jack London, who is no longer with us, uh, was uh, was a great forward-thinking final expense entrepreneur who paved the way for all of us. Uh, the other company that I followed back in those days and had great respect for in those days was Old American Insurance Company. And Old American was doing very nice things in final expense with what they called a, their kind of control distribution. A kind of a career operation. They had managers with uh, assigned territories and uh, they were doing very, very nice things in final expense as well. So we started to study those two companies and decided that, you know what, we can do this. Uh, we got to talking to different FMOs and uh, different organizations and finding out about tens of millions of dollars of premium that was being written in this very underserved at that time market called final expense. Um, there are a lot more seniors out there that are retiring with insufficient income than there are with sufficient income and assets to protect. So we decided that long-term care annuities uh, wasn't really going to be the, the way to go because we really want a simplified issue. And uh, simplified issue was without a question, final expense. 
So we went back to our primary company at that time, who we were writing a great deal of Medicare supplement business with before the NAIC, and the NAIC came in and levelized commissions. And we had a great relationship with them. We were their number two FMO in the nation at that time. And so we asked them if they'd be interested in diversifying their portfolio. They were primarily a health company at that time. And we, were, we wanted to build a final expense program with them. Uh, they decided it would be a good move for them because AMBES likes companies that are diversified. They like diversification within the portfolio. They, uh, they really frown upon health-only companies. Health companies are typically more vulnerable uh, than, than life companies. They, they love life business. So he decided, really for more than anything else, reasons that he had a B-plus rating with AMBEST, thought this might be the, what it might potentially take to get them to an A or an A-minus. So he agreed and let us architect and build, and that was the first final expense program that I was involved with creating. So we built uh, a program with Pioneer Life Insurance Company out of Rockford, Illinois. They're no longer in final expense. Uh, they've been sold multiple times over. The president of the company is no longer alive. But uh, this was, uh, this was my gosh, almost 25 years ago. Um, and we put product together with them. And uh, it seemed like it was almost overnight. We were writing 1,000 policies a month quickly. Um, and we were able to build brand new distribution. Uh, we tried to, we had to build brand new distribution because we had a hard time convincing and turning Medicare supplement agents into final expense agents. And so what I discovered was the best way for me to build final expense distribution was to go after final expense agents selling with final expense companies. Back in those days, uh, uh, Old American and Lincoln Heritage were, quite frankly, foolish enough to advertise all of their top agents <laughs> in a, in a monthly uh, publication. And of course, I got a hold of that, and I went to town. I went to work. Now, it was more difficult back in those days because we did not have the internet. But it wasn't impossible with, uh, with a little bit of tenacity and creative thought. It, was, uh, it wasn't too difficult to find these people once you had their names. So I built essentially the just almost the entire distribution that I have by proselytizing, quite frankly, for bad, lack of a better word, uh, others, uh, others uh, distributions uh, and going after these folks and, and bringing to them alternative product. So we did very, very well with Pioneer Life. Um, uh, and the, the, to follow quickly after that was a company called Shenandoah. Uh, Shenandoah was a fabulous company uh, that had, had gained great market share and final expense uh, 20 years ago under the great direction of a good friend of mine, Jim Henson. It was, uh, it was still very active in the business today. He was their chief marketing officer. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, eventually Chesapeake uh, came into the business. Chesapeake Life did fantastic things um, uh, in the market. And, 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 and many, 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 many companies have come and gone since. But uh, we put together a product uh, back in, uh, I guess it was 95, with uh, a company called National States Insurance Company. And uh, I was the architect and uh, had the uh, exclusive marketing rights to that program as well with another firm that I was affiliated with back in those days, uh, a company out of Texas. And so we had a great run there, built great distribution and uh, contracted uh, people. There was a company out there called Guaranteed Reserve at the time uh, out of Calumet, uh, Illinois. And they had great, uh, great market uh, influence and it was, they were doing great things and, and I found a lot of the great people that I work with today with them. So, you know, I'm not a big believer in, in a lot of advertising because successful agents are successful for a reason and they're not looking for a new home. Successful agents don't need another company. They just need you to get out of their way keep throwing leads at them. That's what they want. That's what they need. They don't need new companies. 
you know, um, I've worked with agencies over the, over the years that have always had this attitude, or at least they did years back, that they've got any new deals coming, new deals, thinking that new deals automatically meant more production. New deals don't represent necessarily more production. You know what they represent? More headaches, more challenges, more to learn, right. more growing pains. Uh, most companies don't know what they're doing. And when I analyze a product, the product is just part of it, okay? Underwriting, rates, commissions, important, but not the most important. Great administration. That's what's important. Great administration with, with, a, with a fair, fairly priced product, uh, with, with good commissions, with very, very... Lean and under lean and underwriting, I think, is really the key. So, um, I've seen so many come and go over the years. Uh, very few have stood the test of time, like uh, Lincoln Heritage, like Old American. You know, hey, they've got high rates, but uh, they they've obviously got some some magic in their sauce because they're highly successful, and no company writes the kind of volume. No company writes anywhere near the kind of volume that Lincoln Heritage writes. But this is not an endorsement for them, okay? I don't represent them, but I have a lot of respect for them, you know. But they've got a system, and they bring neophytes in, and what they typically do is they learn the business, and then they, they end up uh, typically with a company, uh, David, that you're representing or that I'm representing. And, uh, and end up with, with, with uh, you know, a company that uh, is selling a much more competitive premium. Uh, it's typically the way it works. But, so that's, that's a little history for me. So uh, actually, I'm gonna get really to the most important part. So did very well with the, the company that I was with out of Austin. Uh, had Architect, uh, actually three products. Uh, had uh, then put another product together back in Oh, I guess it was 97 with a company called uh, Security Life, uh, uh, headed up uh, uh, by a marketing VP called, named Todd Swinson. Uh, Todd and I are still together today. He was the marketing VP over at Columbia Life Insurance Company, go back over 20 years, um, and uh, consider him to be uh, basically a brother of mine. Uh, super, super good guy. Uh, incredibly ethical, very, very smart, very conservative in his thought. Uh, we uh, we uh, we've just got a great relationship, but we had a we had a final expense program with him. Uh, did very well with that. Built a big name for myself. Built great distribution uh, for the most part through referral. Uh, I I have built almost everything that I've built by going after the largest and most successful producers with competing companies. I'm not really interested in my organization in bringing in neophytes and, and teaching them the business. What I do is I go after superstars and show them another opportunity, another, basically another mousetrap, try to fill a void, uh, try to earn a little bit of their business and hopefully get to the point where I'm earning 60 or 7% of the business with the appropriate product mix, uh, lead generation, and certainly service. Uh, uh, so that's, that's, that's how I've built my entire company. I don't, uh, we used to have card pack uh, advertising way back in those days. And, uh, I don't know if you remember, some of the guys that are gonna be watching this are gonna remember receiving Like that, is that like newspaper inserts? Yeah, well actually it was different. There were these uh, card packs and these cellophane wrapped uh, little, little envelopes and there were about 50 different cards in there sent to insurance agents all over America. And in there would be just a, a, a just a, a mix of, of offerings for all different kind of product lines. You okay. can flip through there and say, oh yeah, here's one I'm interested in. ABC brokerage, you get on the phone and you know, and but but again, I, I have found over the years that most of the people that are shopping for new product are, are typically people that have failed with their existing agencies. And if you've failed with the existing agencies, and listen, they don't, don't get me wrong, there are reasons why people Fail with existing agencies. And a lot of it has to do with, uh, with, with the lack of support, lack of training, lack of leads, lack of lead supervision, 
lack of inspiration, lack of motivation. I could go on and on and on and on. But if this happens three or four times, yeah, you got to probably look in the mirror and realize there might be something wrong with the agent, actually. Right. You know, they're just not motivated. Uh, or maybe it just isn't right for them, you know. So, I, uh, so I've built the bulk of what I do through referral. And because what I do is when I, when I meet a top agent, I know that that top agent attends conferences every year. And when they attend conferences, they make friends. Uh, they make friends with people that live in other regions, other territories, other states. Um, and so I'm always asking people for referrals. Who do you know that isn't necessarily in your backyard that wouldn't be competitive to, with you, uh, but that you respect, that you think would benefit from this particular product? Oh, heck, I've got three or four friends that, you know, that I look forward to seeing every year. One of them lives in Houston, one's out in St. Louis, Missouri. I've got another guy out in Little Rock, Arkansas. We don't do business with each other, but we're buddies. And our wives get together at these conferences and we look forward to seeing each other every year. You know, we've, we've, we've been buddies for a few years. Why don't you give this guy a call? Tell him I told you to call him and tell him I said hello, would you? You tell him I told you to look at this product because, because, uh, because you know, just because I, I told you to. You know what I mean? They just, they, they have fun uh, giving that, that kind of information out. And, uh, and, and they typically are not, they're not, not, they're not afraid to do it. Um, so as soon as you get on the phone to this guy, say, Hey, listen, you know, a buddy of yours out of Houston told me to say hi to you. His name is Jimmy Jones. And, uh, you know, he said, Oh my God, how's Jimmy doing? I haven't seen him in four months. Uh, you know, it's, you know, since we were together in, you know, Puerto Vallarta, you know, at the last sales conference with, you know, Columbia Life or whoever it may be. And, um, and they're like, yeah, he's doing great, man. And he's been doing very well with this, this this new pro program that we've introduced them to, we thought you might benefit from it. There's uh, there's a couple of places where it may fill some voids. Let me uh, let me tell you let me tell you what those voids might be. Now the key, one of the keys to my success is the fact that I know my competition inside and out. Agents must know their competition as well as they know their own companies. That they, re that they represent. You must know your competition inside now. You've got to become a student of final expense. And so the first thing I always ask an agent when I'm talking to them is, who do you represent now? I want to be able, I want to tell you right up front how I might be able to complement your existing portfolio. I may not be able to, but there may be some areas where I might be able to help fill some voids. So tell me who you represent, because a lot of times they can just tell me, if, you, if you're, you're new on the phone with somebody, you tell them, hey, listen, tell me who you're representing. They tell me, you know, who are you? I'm going to tell you. You know, give them a reason. You're immediately going to take their guard down and let them know I want to help you. Tell, I, know you I, know, I, know, I know the competition well. Um, tell me who you're representing, and I'll tell you how I may or may not be able to help you. Get this taken care of in 45 seconds. I don't want to waste your time. Well, I sell for Foresters. I sell for Transamerica. I sell for Liberty Bankers. Great. Well, let me tell you what I what I think we can do with Columbia Life that you currently can't do with your existing companies, and then you just kind of go in and, and, and talk about what the, what those features may be. Um, so it's important to know your competition well, so that you can talk intelligent to somebody uh, about what it is that you might be able to do for them with an additional carrier. Um, and not only that, it'll it'll help you to gain credibility quickly. It helps you gain credibility quickly with your client. Same thing goes for my agents. You want your agents to be able to walk into a house and be able to say, okay, oh gosh, you've got to you have a policy here with, uh, with Americo. They're a great company. I know them well. I'm Dallas, Texas. Been around for a long time. Um, but you know what? You know, our program here may be able to fill some additional voids. Um, how, how long have you had your policy in place now? Well, I've had it for you know, two and a half years. Well, you know what? That policy is as good as gold. Keep it, guard it, protect it. I'm not one to advocate for replacements when coverages are over two years old because once they get past that two year contestable period, the policy is as good as gold. I'm all about trying to write some additional coverage if they have room in their budget for it, but uh, I don't advocate replacement of business that's over two years old. I think it's very dangerous. I think it's a, it's a it's a dangerous practice. Now, 
sometimes there are good reasons to do it, but normally there are not, you know. Um, but again, this is this is a judgment call that has to be made at the time of sale. So, uh, but 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 uh, so those are some of the things that I think will, will help you. Is again, product knowledge is critical. Knowing your competition again, that just comes with time. So going back to what you know, how I kind of elevated to the to the point that I'm at now. Um, when I was 35, back in the year 2000. I was looking in the mirror, wondering what I might have been able to have accomplish had I had the courage to take that leap of faith and, and to step out. Because I was working as an employee uh, uh, for these other two agencies and doing very well for them, making a living for myself. And I thought, you know what? It's time for me to go out and do what it is that the others that I now work for and that I have worked for in the past and had the courage to do. And every entrepreneur out there, every agency out there needs to be commended for their, their, their entrepreneurism. It, it takes a lot of courage to step out of your comfort zone. I was in a comfort zone. I was making very good money, but I was riding the coattails of the agencies I worked for. Uh, I had very, very good mentors in my life. And I think it's important to recognize the, the leaders uh, and the mentors in your life and to at some point thank them. Another thing that I learned uh, by, from John Maxwell was to, that it's important to go back to some of the people, recognize the fact that you're where you are today if you've done well because you've had great mentors that have cared about you, that have raised you, that have lifted you, that have poured into you. You are who you are today because of the good people that believed in you. So uh, I have made it a point to go back and to thank and to recognize the many mentors that I've had in my life, people that have believed in me. Because there are times in our business, it's a very lonely, it's a very difficult business, and there are times when we down on ourselves and we wonder, if I'm doing the right thing, is this for me? Um, can I do this? You know, it's a scary, scary uh, business. It, it really can be. It's a, it's a business that is won and lost between your ears, you know what I mean? It's uh, it's a mind game. And uh, you have to have great tenacity and great self-belief in order to continue to sustain success in this business. I had a great mentor of mine years back tell me that you have not, you have not arrived in this business until you can live off your renewals. And I just love that. Um, you think about that. This, this is, this, this is the game of renewals. This is what excites me. What excites me in this business is the fact that when a sale is made, it's not just a paycheck on Friday, it's a paycheck eight years from now, 12 years from now. You know, when we write people that are 67 years old and they're in pretty good health, they can be with us for 15 or 20 years. So uh, it's important to think about every sale that you make is not just a, a piece of business that's going to put a paycheck uh, you know, in your bank in the next couple of days, but it's also one that's uh, an investment. Uh, uh, it's, 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 it's investment in your future, you know, because that's what this business is. We're building long-term residual income, and that's, that's the beauty of the business. But when I was 35, I made the decision to go off on my own, and uh, I contacted my father up in Rhode Island, and, uh, and I don't mind telling you, I was making 165000 at the time, had benefits, had country club membership, I had a Mercedes lease, I was living really good. I had a young um, uh, um, boy at home, um, my wife was at home taking care of uh, my son, life was good. Um, but I knew that I had this burning desire to, I knew that one day that if I didn't do this, I would wake up at, at age 65, looking in the mirror, wondering what you might have been able to have achieved and you had the courage to go off on your own. And I, I never wanted to have that. I never want, I don't, I never wanted to wake up at, 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 at some point at the end of my career and wonder, you know, what if, what I might have been able to have accomplished. So I hope that everybody that's watching this today understands and, and will will take a little bit of inspiration from this because um, our success is a choice. It is. It's, it's, it's a choice, it's a, it's a, it's a choice based on good decisions versus bad decisions. 
and uh, and then and then work. That's all it is. There's there's no there's no stopping. Look like you know, I want I want what you have. I want to be like you when I get older. And I ask people, it's pretty darn good being me right now. It really is. I'm 53. I I make a lot of money. I have great fulfillment, but I don't remember my 30s. I don't because I worked so darn hard. Yeah, it's funny. My my dad Perfect. said the same exact thing uh, when he yeah. like I told you he had a chemical business in Atlanta. He doesn't remember <laughs> when I was a kid because all he did was work. It was on his mind the entire time, and and understandably now I, I get it now, you know, because that's yeah. that's the uh, inflection point that you're building towards, and you're pouring your heart and soul into it. Right, you bet, and that's and that's what happened for me as well. Because again, I. I, I saw people making tremendous amounts of money in this business that were not educated. Uh, I was kind of raised in, I was raised up in the Northeast and education is really important up there. We've got a lot of great Ivy League schools up there. And their attitude is, I mean, hey, if you haven't finished, at least got a four year degree, your, your doors won't open for you. You're just not going to make much of yourself. So that was kind of pounded into my, into my mind. Um, but I, I never really believed in it. And um, but in the back of my mind, it, it was there. So I, I, uh, I, I just, uh, I, I, it wasn't really in the cards for me. But then I just decided, you know, again, I was watching. Again, that's the beautiful thing about our particular business. People can make great incomes in this particular business doing things that are just outstanding for their community, within their communities. And it, it, being in a win-win business that doesn't require a lot of outlay of money, you're not, we're not, we're not inventorying tremendous amounts of stock. We're not, you know what I mean? We're not, this is a very simple business. We can run it out of our homes. We do run it out of our homes. Um, and, and it doesn't, it doesn't require a tremendous amount of money in order to make a great, great living. So, uh, but I decided after watching many, many people making quite frankly, millions of dollars in this in this space and that kind of money can be made not realistic for most of the people obviously that are on the uh, that are that are going to be watching this and that's fine that's not necessarily the goal the goal is is happiness fulfillment uh, a nice comfortable income if your goal is to work three days a week in the field uh paperwork on thursday taking friday off saturday sunday having three-day weekends that's fine but that wasn't for me you know, I was, uh, you'll never call my office on a Friday afternoon at four o'clock and not find me here. I don't have to be here. I can take Fridays off if I choose to, but I choose not to because I was raised to believe that we are supposed to work full, full time. It's not part time. It's full time. We work full time Monday through Friday from, you know, whatever it may be from nine to five or nine to five thirty, whatever it may be. I tell my agents, if you'll treat this like a full-time job, you will be blown away by what you're going to be making with back-end commissions and renewals just three and four and five years out. So treat it like a full-time job and uh, you get to a point where you have that great cushion coming in uh, called those, you know, called renewals. Uh, that, uh, that, that make our lives so much easier and take all that stress away as we, as we move on through our, through our careers. But I started my company back at the age of 35. I called my dad and he said, listen, you know, this is what you want to do. I'm in full support, which really surprised me because I thought he'd be like, are you crazy and make a great income? Why would you walk away from such a thing? Take the safe route. Yeah. Exactly, but no, he was all about it. And I, it really shocked me. He said, as a matter of fact, move back here, come back in, in, into our home, move back in with mom and dad at the age of 35 with your family. And uh, we've got a little bit of room down in the basement. Uh, it was an old Victorian home uh, with a dirt floor, quite frankly, uh, with asbestos wrapped pipes. And uh, he said, put an office down there. I did that. We sold everything. I moved back to Rhode Island back in August. Uh, uh, April of 2000 and uh, went to work 18 hour days in my dad's basement 
dehumidifiers running like crazy to keep the moisture away from uh, the computers and phone systems. The this was the burn the bridges moment in your career, it sounds like. You're not kidding. You're not kidding. This is when I was just killing it. And uh, I had a, uh, uh, we were sharing a bedroom with our son. Uh, you know, we're very, it was, again, a small home. Um, but I had this, I have no opportunity, I mean, I have no choice but to, but, but, but to be successful attitude. Uh, I had $150,000 to my name uh, that I was able to save over the years working, uh, you know, because at that point I'd already been in for quite a few years and doing fairly well, but that's all I had. And I was scared. I spent $30,000 pretty quick uh, getting my office set up, uh, computer equipment, phones, everything I needed to do, licensing, getting all that taken care of. But I uh, found out that I had a lot of really loyal friends in business and uh, I was able to uh, reconnect with so many people that I had relationships with. This is a relationship business. People do business with people that they like, people that they know have their back. And so many of the people that do what I do that are in marketing, uh, on the marketing side of it are not ethical. And, uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, you trust with them, especially as an agency, you trust with them the most important thing you have, which is your relationships, your seven or eight people that are out there uh, that you've poured into, that you've trained, that now work, work for you, work with you, that you support. And uh, you bring them to an FMO, and then you find out a year from now, two years from now, six months from now, that FMO is now making other product offerings directly to them, undercutting you. That is so absolutely unacceptable. Um, I don't play those games. Uh, I've never played those games. I never will play those games. I don't need the business, especially at this point. I don't need the business up to the point where I'm going to harm uh, people that have been good to me. So um, because I have always done things the right way, people were quickly to come. They were very quick to come back to me. Uh, so I started with Boston Mutual back in 2000, had a wonderful run with them. But again, like most companies they're in today, they're gone tomorrow. So, so was this a final expense uh, product that you're you're repping? I've, I've heard of them, but I didn't know they had an involvement in final expense. They had a wonderful final expense product that came into the market back in 2000. So my timing was perfect. I was able to get in with them at the ground floor. I became immediately their number one uh, FMO almost over overnight. Uh, we were writing over six million a year with them quickly. Had a great run. Uh, great friends up there. Uh, uh, but it only lasted about four years. Most companies that get in final expense are not serious about it. They have kind of an ancillary interest uh, in the market. They know of it. They want to they taste it. They want to test it. And that's what they do. And then they figure out that, you know what, it's a little bit more difficult to make this money in this particular space than maybe they thought. Uh, when they see that they're not meeting pricing expectations, their mortality numbers might be coming in higher than what they had priced for. They get scared. They pull out of the market. Why do they pull out? Because they don't need it. They're highly successful in other areas. So that's that's one of the very real concerns that we've always got when we get involved with the carrier. Todd Swinson, the guy that I met, mentioned uh, earlier that I had business uh, a business relationship with uh, uh, with Security Life back in uh, 97. Uh, when I joined, uh, actually when I started my company back in 2000, I contacted Todd right away to let him know that I had left the organization that I was with. He was with Columbia Life at this point. He would left uh, Security Life uh, or back, back in, uh, I guess it was 98 or 99, and he joined Columbia Life. So I contacted Todd, and Todd said, well, heck, you know, I'm with Colombian, as you know. Uh, Colombian's been involved in final expense at that time for 120 years. And uh, quite, I mean, that's what they do. Uh, their, their primary line of business always has been small face amount life insurance. That grabbed my attention. He said, Alan, what I want to do is I want to fly you into the home office up here in Binghamton, New York. I want to introduce you to our president and uh, our chief marketing officer, our marketing VPs. I want you to meet our head, uh, head underwriter, and I want you to take a hard look at our portfolio. And I want you to consider coming to work with us. And uh, I did that. I flew up to the home office. Um, I was working again with, with Boston Mutual, but I knew that I was looking for that, that I 
was looking for that. I wanted that big hit. I wanted that primary company that I could really dive in deep with. Um, I was doing very well with Boston Mutual, but I knew that this was kind of a test market for them. So I, in the back of my mind, realized that it's, this may not last. So got with Colombian and my big interest in them, the reason I had a big, big interest in pushing hard for them was because they really understood and have since day one, that small face amount life insurance business for that nominal need and that blue collar market. That's what they do. That's what they've done since day one. So went in there, met them, looked at their product, met the people, decided, you know what? These are my kind of folks. Uh, they're not a big giant company. They're small enough where you can get to know the people at every level, all the way up from president down. Um, they're a mutual company. Uh, been around for again well over 100 years. Uh, all they understood was small face amount of life insurance. Uh, but the final expense program that they were selling back in those days had lots of flaws. And uh, so they told me that they wanted me to revamp their product. Well, you know, and what we really want, Alan, is we want your contacts. We, we need, we don't have the right distribution in place. And again, the market was relatively new back in these days. Uh, Columbia Life, as an example, is the first company in America to write an insulin-dependent diabetic a full benefit. They all do it now. They were the first company to write a full benefit uh, on a diabetic using insulin. They had the stats back in those days where they knew what was eating on them. They knew what they could live with. These are stats that go back many, many, many years that the other companies didn't have. So they were able to take a step uh, kind of a, uh, a bold step forward and to give me, because I told him, these, I, hear, I, I said, give me an opportunity to create and, and architect the next, uh, the next generation of final expense products with your company. So Todd and I were tasked to do that. And that's exactly what we did. We completely redid their product. Uh, we came out with some very forward thinking, uh, very, uh, advanced underwriting. When I say advanced, uh, very lenient, very forward thinking, very uh, kind of out of the box underwriting. Uh, diabetics on insulin, full benefit, people that are taking medications for blood, uh, you know, blood thinners for, for a heart attack or a stroke uh, or, or, or recent heart surgery. As long as those procedures or the, the actual event was over two years ago, you know, even if they were taking five different blood thinners, uh, we could give them a full benefit. So we built a product that uh, I was able to grab the attention of a lot of people quickly. So uh, that was back in, in 2000. I've been with Columbia for over, well, for over well, 17 years now. And that has become, uh, and, and it is my flagship company. And so Columbian Life, uh, and, and I have a, a super great relationship. I always tell the agents, you need to understand that the first winner in every deal must be the carrier. And again, understand, I, I've had great mentors in my life. The first market organization I worked for had to have a different attitude. Their attitude was success through frenzy. Uh, you, you ride a company as long as you can, and it, if, it, if, it, if it doesn't make money and they pull out of the market, no big deal, there's another one in line, jump on. That was, that was a bad attitude, but their attitude was, if you get three to five years out of a deal, you've done well, move on to the next one. But, but recruit, recruit, recruit. So I learned how to recruit there. Um, but I didn't learn how to care about my carrier there. Then the second company that I joined out of Austin, Texas, they taught me how to actually, how to, how to actually care about my carrier, how to care about the company's bottom line, and um, the, the, uh, the principal there in that agency, in that company, uh, was ex-home office. He was the uh, chief marketing officer, marketing VP, uh, for a large life company for many years. So he understood the necessity for the company to be the first winner. The company must make money. If the company does not make money, we don't have a deal. We don't have a long-term deal. And um, so he taught me how to care about the carrier. And, and the way to care about a carrier is to be careful about who you hire. You're only as good as the people that you, you recruit. Uh, he taught me that the, be 
best time to fire somebody is the first time you think about it. That you hire, uh, and, and you think about this, you fire your failures fast. John Maxwell taught me that it's okay. It's okay to say goodbye to the people along this journey called life. If people are not on the same path that you're on, uh, say goodbye to them. Get them out of your way. Get the naysayers out of your way. And I'm a big believer in that, so I've been following that philosophy. So I, I had great training. I learned how to recruit through frenzy. Uh, and then I learned how to be very particular about who I recruited. I learned how to teach the importance of making sure that the first that the first winner in the deal is going to be the insurance company. And we do that by not cheating. We do that by making sure that we are not overselling. We do that by making sure that we're writing quality business that we feel like in our heart is truly in the best interest of the consumer, that does truly meet underwriting expectations, and that will probably stay on the books for the long haul because it doesn't do anybody any good if a piece of business comes off the books in three months or even in three years. People need to understand when they buy a final expense policy, it's a lifelong financial commitment. You're 65, I hope you're around when you're 85, which means you're gonna be paying this $58 premium 20 years from now. So let's make sure we put you into a premium that you can afford. What is your monthly income? You got about 1200 bucks to work with, you have no right in a $180 premium at all. That's obnoxious, it's self-serving for the agent, and it's wrong. People with a $1,200 a month income shouldn't be spending probably more than 40 or 50 bucks a month. You know, that's, we all know this to be true. And we're probably shaking our head and thinking, yeah, I agree with you, or well, yeah, and I'm thinking, yeah, because hey, we're all guilty, we've all done this, you know. Yeah, it's not good for the agent either, because he'll be out of the business within 12 months because of all the chargebacks he's gonna get. You're not kidding, so we have to write business. When I see people that have, and again, we manage the heck up out of our business, but we do it in order to help the carrier, but also help educate agents. Agents that have high uh, not taken rates, low placement rates are typically overselling. So we talk to them about that. And, uh, and we, try to, we, try to, we try to hone them in and try to help agents to understand they've got to write quality over quantity because if it doesn't stay, it doesn't pay. You know, it's, it's in everybody's best interest, obviously, to write business that we really feel like is going to stick uh, long term. So, but, but again, getting back to, again, how I, my, how I started again, uh, I went to work uh, heavy with Colombian, and the timing was good because then Boston Mutual decided to get out of that market. And, uh, and then I was uh, in there just super, super uh, uh, heavy and deep with Colombian life. And in uh, and, and the ride that I've had with Colombian has, has been amazing, continues to be amazing, will continue to be amazing. Uh, uh, they, their management team is, is the same, same folks that were there uh, 17 years ago when I joined the company. They're very consistent. Uh, they they uh, typically will advance people from within. So we don't have, we have brand new presidents. That president was with the company 17 years ago. Started out on the financial side. And he's now the president of the company. So uh, the, the philosophies, the, the culture doesn't change. Everything remains the same. So um, you know, I'm a big believer that you have to pick. You have to figure out what company you're most comfortable with. And I I like having a a number one first choice carrier. I like having a very very large statement with a carrier uh, you have to have multiple companies in your bag because it's just it's just necessary in order to be able to serve all the needs that you're going to be running into but i think it's great to have a a first choice company a company that you you hold in very high esteem uh, one that you're building a very very meaningful statement with one that you qualify for conference with year after year, and uh, a company where you can build a voice. And uh, that's, uh, I think that's served agents very, very well. And, um, and 
and uh, it, it, it's very difficult to become an expert with four or five different companies. You're not going to. You're going to have kind of a, a, a pretty good feel for that company from 500 feet up, but you're not going to really know boots on the ground level. Uh, everything, everything that you really want to know in order to be able to have that confidence to be able to service your people and to be able to make sales. Because let's face it, the more you know about a company, uh, the more confident you're going to be with that company. And the more confident you are with that company, the more you're going to be able to sell with them uh, with conviction, you know, because conviction is what, what sells. People can read that on you. And um, I mean, I'm not smart enough to be able to be an expert with multiple companies. I do represent multiple companies, uh, but, but I have one company that I feel like I'm an absolute expert on, but of course I'm one of the architects of the product as well. So, I mean, I helped build it. Um, I helped build their website. Uh, when I joined the company, they didn't have a website. Most companies didn't have websites 15, 16, 17 years ago. Um, so it's, uh, it's, been a, it's been a fun evolutionary process. Uh, but, um, you know I, know, I know you've got a, probably some, some things you want to add or, or, or questions you might want to ask. So I'll, I'll, I've been going on and on here. So I'll, I'll jump in here, buddy. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for the, uh, for the detailed background and history. Again, that's why I brought you on because you've been around long enough to uh, see agencies flourish from beginning to where they are today and, and, and have relationships with all sorts of successful final expense agents, which kind of leads me to this question I have for you. So and you kind of hit on this a little bit, Alan. Um, I'm curious, based on your experience, you've recruited more than 10,000 agents. What do you think, what qualities does an, a successful final expense agent possess? Then what qualities does a successful final expense agency possess? And then I'm asking three part question here. Is there any difference between an agent that's successful selling final expense and an agent? Is there different qualities that either or have, or is it exactly the same? You know, the agents that I have that are the most successful are agents that number one, have a dynamite work ethic. I think it's, I think it's important for, Agents to again hone in on the carrier that they're most excited about. Uh, get qualified for a conference. Qualify for at least one conference every year, and uh, and build a name for yourself with that company. Make sure that company knows who you are. Make sure that the, the marketing VPs know who you are. There are very few. Uh, the percentage of agents in a in a in a, in a field force that actually qualifies for uh, their sales conference is incredibly small incredibly small so you know i'm not i get excited about the top 10 agents but i get more excited about every conference qualifier they are in, within a very very unique uh, fraternity if you will of people it's a very special group i don't think that people that qualify for conferences um receive enough recognition for qualifying quite frankly uh when you qualify for a conference that means you put the high majority of your business with a specific company and that company is has been enriched with your business and is thanking you by taking you and your in your 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 guest uh, to a beautiful resort somewhere and I think that's wonderful I mean that is that, that is a terrific way to say thank you but maybe it's the agents agents need to realize just how big a deal that is uh, it's a really terrific honor to be among that particular group so get qualified, feel like a, a, a rock star, have that red carpet rolled out for you. Um, Columbia, I mean, I tell you, I've, I've been on every conference. I've, I've worked with so many different companies over the years. Columbia Life puts together the best conference I've ever been to uh, in my life. The president of the company is there to greet your bus when it arrives at the resort. He's not hiding upstairs in his suite and only to appear during an event. Uh, he's there to shake your hand when you get off that bus and he knows who you are because he studied your, your picture before you even arrived. And uh, it's, it's really special. Uh, appreciation for the, the things that, that, that you do in the field, I feel like are, are critical. Uh, you, you wanted me to hit on uh, uh, numerous things, um, but um, I think it's important for an agent to uh, feel appreciated uh, and, and to be to be honored for what it is that they're, that they're doing. 
and I think there are too many agents that, that are out there working that never hear from anybody, and they 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 deserve praise uh, because again they have they have uh, opportunities to work for so many different companies and they can go sell anywhere they want to. Uh, so when they choose to sell the majority of their business with you, they they need to feel appreciated and they need to be honored for the business they're doing. Kind of where I'm going with this is, you know, sometimes there's agents that think there's a discrepancy between what's good for the agent and what's good for the agency as far as being successful. And what I'm curious about, since you're in the position of dealing directly with not just any agents, but the most successful is that's your more or less your approach is how do you recruit, but you also deal with very successful agencies. Um, is, is there a, 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 is there the same alignment on the qualities of being successful or, you know, it should, is there a conflict between them? Should there be, I'm just kind of, if you know where I'm kind of go here uh, with what I'm asking here, I'm just curious to see, is it, is it the same characteristics that make an agency successful as it does an agent or is there something different? You know, I think that the characteristics as it relates to what makes an agency successful and an agent successful are, are a little bit different uh, for an agent. I think what makes an agent, an agent successful, obviously is number one, having a terrific work, work ethic. Uh, you've got to be smart. Obviously, you have to work hard. You, you really have to have you, you have to have a discipline. There has to be you have to be driven. You have to be uh, uh, again self motivated. And uh, some some agencies do a better job motivating their people than others. Some people just basically want to be left alone. Give me your leads on Monday morning and get out of my way. I'll tell you how I did on Friday. You know, and that's just the way the way some people want to work. Uh, so I feel like. Uh, things that make agents super successful are the agents the agents that are, are most successful are agents that are focused in typically on one company. When an agent is focused in on trying to get qualified for a conference and they know that when they walk into a house that they're, they're pulling out Columbia life as an example, uh, because that's the company that they're most comfortable with, unless there's a health issue that says, you know what? I can do better for you with another company using a different product. Uh, but agents that are focused in on, on one or two products are typically the most successful. Agents that have eight and ten products in their bag uh, with no real alliance with any carrier typically are the least successful. And when agencies give their agents too many choices, you're confusing them and you're giving them temptation that is always typically taken when it re with reference to debit balances. Right. So um, I, I, I have three cases that just came off the books with carrier A, and I now owe $1,800 to them, but yet carrier you know B, C, and D are clean, no debt. But where do you think the business is going to go this week? You know, I've got to make a paycheck. You know, my mortgage is due next week. You know, and I'm fourteen hundred dollars shy of making that payment. <laughs> you're going to leave that company alone that you owe eighteen hundred bucks to, and you're now going to go ahead and place your business with company B, and then as soon as you owe money to them, you're going to company C, and then company D, and then company E, and before you know it, you've got a six or seven thousand dollar debit balance or more between three or four different companies. So agencies that make that mistake typically uh, run into very very large problems fast. So the agencies that hone in and encourage uh, the majority of their business with one company and, and agencies that don't give too many options to their agents typically do better. You've got to have a guaranteed issue product in your bag. You've got to have opportunities for COPD, uh, opportunities where there are height and weight issues. You've got to give opportunities uh, like that. But Outside that, most companies have very similar underwriting. You know, they really do. So you just got to figure out who you're most comfortable with, and uh, and, and and make that that company your primary focus. Um, but agents that, again, I find that agents that have clear direction and know before they walk into a house the company that they want to pull out, the company that they're really trying to. Get quality, you know, qualify for a conference with those are the ones that seem to do the best. So that's why I feel like it's a big deal to get agents early on in the year focused in on whatever company it is that you want them focused in with or on. Uh, uh, 
as it relates to conference, because if you're if you get behind after two, three, four months uh, early in the year, you're you're, you're done. You, you're, your your focus is off. So you want them to know what company is that they're pushing for early in the year in January, and if it's six thousand a month is what what's going to get you there, then you better better try to write yourself at least eight or ten thousand with that company this month. You know what I mean? Give yourself that cushion because you're going to run into some some snags at some point. You may have an issue with leads four months into the year, or you may uh, you may decide you're going to take some time off, or you just may run into a slump. You know, so you want to always obviously hit something higher than whatever it is your, your objective may be, which might be at, you know, 6,000 a month or whatever the number might be with a company, but you've got to have both agents focused in. And you want to make sure that you create agencies that have great success or agencies that, again, are all focused in with a carrier. And the goal is to get as many of our people at the conference as possible. We're all going to be there together as a team with our spouses, and we're going to have a blast. And uh, we're going to make it essentially our company party, our company convention, you know, not just the carrier's convention. So uh, agencies that focus in like that, and we have a, we have, that's exactly what I've done with Columbia. We've got people, and again, the, the nice thing about Columbia, Columbia Life is that when, when agents qualify for a conference with them, they qualify for all the conferences because they do such a good job. They make people feel so special. So the agencies really love, and, and and, and, and again, I, I'm going to keep plugging Columbian because it just seems to be the one that, that works the best. The bulk of the people that qualify for conferences are young guys, young guys and young gals. Okay. Young guys and young gals have kids. All right. And they want to bring their kids to conference. Okay. Because it's their one trip per year that they can look forward to. And Colombian's trips for the most part are beach. And when you go to beaches, the kids want to go. You know, your 12 and your 14 and your 15 year old kids, they want to be there. Well, Colombian is a kid friendly conference. They encourage the kids to come. Most companies do not allow the kids to come. So this is just intelligent. Most of the people that qualify for our conferences are in their 20s and 30s. And we have people in their 40s and 50s as well, and even some in their 60s. But we have a tremendous amount of people in their 20s and 30s that qualify for conferences, and they all have young kids. So, um, again, it turns into one big family affair. It's a great, great time. So get them focused in on a conference. That'll keep them focused all year. Get their spouses involved because their spouses will, you know, they'll, they'll be nudging them along constantly. How'd you do this week? Are we on track? You know, they want to go, you know, so, so that, that helps. So, uh, again, a agencies that, that seem to focus in on one company, uh, for the most part, seem to do the best. Uh, agents, I, I feel like there's there is similarity there uh, in that agents uh, that that focus in on, on try to focus that they do try to focus in on one company seem to do uh, better than agents that are uh, really not committed to any one product or any one company. Uh, agents that are committed uh, to a specific company seem to do better than the ones that are all over the board and don't know really where they're going to what they're going to pull out when they walk. So that kind of focus, I think, makes makes a big difference, Dave. The final question I want to ask you today, uh, I ask everybody this because uh, if you watch the news, you can't help but to see uh, either Amazon taking over the world uh, company by company with their acquisitions or their technology, or you see how uh, 30 or 40 percent of the population are going to lose their jobs. And certainly there are concerns among salespeople that what's going to happen in 20 years? Or are we going to even sell insurance face-to-face, -face, much less have a marketplace for it? Now, final expenses, you know, is, is different from a lot of other lines of insurance. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of agents don't understand it until they get into it, that it's, it's, a, it's a different animal altogether. And so I'm curious to see what your thoughts are on where we're going to be in the next 10 to 20 years and how if, if automation or how if technology is going to have any significant impact on the current day-to-day -day approach that we use, typically face-to-face -face sales, selling final expense. Yeah, technology is certainly going to have, uh, it's going to play a role. It's playing a role now. We are now selling uh, electronically, in some cases with some companies, electronic apps. Uh, we do have more and more call centers that are popping up that are that are doing well. Uh, and, uh, but, 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 and, and of course, there are more and more people using the internet. Now, um, I think that final expense will predominantly continue to be sold 
happened in our lifetime face to face the old fashioned way because we're dealing with a very simple minded group of folks uh, people that are not tech savvy typically uh, especially now I mean the bulk of the people that we sell to they don't use the internet they don't even know what the internet is and they do not have iPads okay they just don't they have flip phones okay it's amazing if they know how to send a text okay it, 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 and that's a fact uh, so that's that's our business uh, these people still want personalized service okay and I and I use the word personalized uh, and, and I, I, mean, I can't emphasize enough the word personalized they still want somebody to come by to see them to explain to them to point to them exactly what it is that you're trying to explain to them and that kind of service uh, can't be replaced over the phone so I feel very bullish about the fact that final expense will still be sold predominantly face-to-face uh, -face as it is today um, with personalized service where people are essentially holding uh, holding these people's hands through the process um, I do believe that there will be a greater demand for call center opportunity uh, in the future because uh, we do now have more and more baby boomers even though they're not making much money they do understand and they do use the internet they know how to use the internet they do use the internet they do use a computer um, that's they're not going to stop using the computer so this younger group of baby boomers when uh, you know when they're older and now really good candidates for final expense five and ten years from now when they're in their 60s um, even though they know how to use a computer uh, they still have very low income and we have more and more people that are retiring broke uh, today, more so than ever. Uh, and I don't believe that cycle is going to change. And, do you see? Uh, do you see technology altering how we act, acquire leads? Because as, as you know, direct mail is king in this business, and some agents have expressed concern and wonder if technology is going to overtake that. What's your thoughts on that? You know, I do believe that we're going to generate more and more leads in the future through technology. And um, so I think that the lead generation will, will, I think that we're gonna, direct mail will continue, I believe, to do what it's doing now. I've heard people complain about and worry about direct mail for the last 10 years, um, but it still came today. Yeah. It's still the very best lead today in our particular space, okay? But there are more and more people that are using the internet and there are more and more companies that are gathering uh, data, strategic data that, uh, that, that is being used for lead generation. Um, so I think that there will be more lead companies that pop up in the future that are generating uh, leads uh, via the internet, but I still feel like direct mail will still play a major role as well and I still believe that the bulk of the final expense business being sold in the future will still be uh, um, eyeball to eyeball and uh, through agent street distribution. Great. Well, Alan, I want to round out today's uh, conversation. I want to express my uh, gratitude for, I know you're extremely busy and I thank you so much for sharing uh, your life experience in the final expense businesses. As I say with my other interviews, I think it's really important to, uh, share this uh, this kind of training and these stories with, with new agents and experience as well, just because there's such a lack of it, unfortunately. And uh, if, if someone's interested in learning more about uh, what you do, uh, how can they reach out to you? Well, they can find me on my, on my website, certainly. They can contact me in my office. Uh, agent Service Connection uh, it can be Googled, and, and I can be found that way. Uh, my website is uh, ASC finalexpense.com uh, and my phone number of course is uh, is uh, is on there but my phone number is 941-907-9390 extension 3 uh, that would get them directly into me uh, so but I appreciate the opportunity and I think in closing what I just like to tell people again there's 
I have nothing uh, on anybody that's watching this video other than probably just time. I've been in this business for an awful long time. I've watched it uh, uh, morph into something quite impressive. Uh, final expense uh, 15 years ago was kind of looked down on within the life insurance industry. And it's now, it's now being respected in ways that I'm, I'm, I'm so proud of. And, uh, you know, I, I, I've, seen, I, that I've, seen, I've seen that attitudes have changed. And there's a lot of intrigue uh, with reference to what it is that we're, we're doing in the communities that we serve. So we should all be very, very proud of that. And, uh, but again, there's, there's the only thing that I would recommend or that I can offer to people is that all I get, all I have on, on, on you is time in the business. I'm, I'm no smarter, but I, I am, I am one of those guys that puts the blinders on. I don't get distracted. I know what it is I'm trying to accomplish and I run hard and I don't let anybody get in my way. And I know my business inside and out. And if you'll take that same attitude, learn your business, learn it inside and out, know your competition, get the naysayers out of your life, get them out of your way, keep a clear mind, and do the same things every day. My success is through repetition. And I want yours to be the same. Yours will be the same way. Success comes through repetition. It comes through doing the same thing each and every day. You get up, you go to work stay on that regiment and then you wake up and four and five years later you have this terrific renewal and back-end commission coming in and you realize my gosh if I don't work this month I still pay my bills wow what a wonderful business I'm in so I wish everybody great success it's a wonderful business and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be with you Alan thank you for your time sir I appreciate it okay thanks so much take care